Welcome to A Professor's Life, your fortnightly podcast on all things academia. I'm Chris. With me tonight here is Robert. Hello. And Stephen. I am Stephen. And today we are going to be talking about an article that uh, I came across on the New York Times website called What's the Point of a Professor by Mark Bauerlein. It was posted May 9th, 2015, uh, although I just came across it here in early July. Uh, the press, the article is largely about, well, as the title suggests, what's the point of our job if uh, we're not interacting with students? <laughs> well, wait, to clarify, this is actually an article written by a professor, too. Yes, a professor at Emory, yes. So uh, Mark uh, Bauerlein is a professor of English at Emory. Um, so, yeah, we should definitely clarify that because... I don't want it to come off as being written by like a politician or something like that. It's somebody actually does know about higher education. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So basically what he talks about was, you know, back in his day, uh, there was a lot more interaction between the uh, professors and the students, uh, not just in class, but outside of class. There was long lines outside of the professor's uh, offices with students waiting to, to see the faculty member. And um, he makes an argument that the change of university culture here over the last, let's say, decade or so, I mean, this is a change I think that has gradually happened, uh, but over the last decade, maybe the effects are more noticeable, uh, where you're seeing less interaction with the professors and the students. The professor moved sort of from a um, role model to an accreditor. And that's sort of how he ends the article is, you know, back in his day, you looked up to the professor as someone of, uh, to learn from essentially right someone who graded you who, who uh evaluated your work and sh now it's basically this person's an accreditor there's so many a's given out compared to when he was in college so on and so forth so um let's start the discussion what do you guys think well Are we i agree and disagree uh yeah <laughs> like every academic response <laughs> so i think uh half of it's the students and half of it's the professors. So there's some students that just want their piece of paper. That's the whole point. They came to college, they want their little stamp, and then they're going to move on. Uh, or they're there because they didn't know what else to do, and they see it as high school part two, just don't give a crap, or they're just to get their grades and move on. Then I think there's one still that uh, want to learn, you know, still we're looking for something more than just the credential. Mm -hmm. They want to either deeper understanding, the planning on going to grad school, uh, they want some practical skills to go along with whatever may be in the classroom. They want something that's totally unrelated to the classroom that they think you can do as the supposed expert in your area, uh, put them into, they might want to hook into your professional network. Um, so I think some of it's on the student end, and then some of it is definitely on our end. Uh, I've seen very different views on why one would ever teach an undergraduate? You know, why would I waste my time that way? Mm -hmm. uh, some that see the idealized position is I teach a doc seminar and nothing else. You know, so I can only talk to students who are worthy of my attention. Um, I've seen some that uh, do the minimum required office hours, and that's it. Uh, and if you can't talk to them and they're during their office hours, screw you. Uh, or others that, you know, spend all their time becoming advisors to clubs and mentoring the students and you know have informal office hours that are even off campus uh i know you 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 put on an entire freaking party for your the kids in your department uh, at your house so yeah. a lot of professors yeah. don't want students to know where they even live or if they live <laughs> uh you know they want them all to be calling them doctor or, you know like we're all running around in our robes still having lunch that way um, so I think it's about a 50-50 split, which I got, the article seemed not to really come across that way. So that it was just the nature of the beast kind of a thing. And I don't think it is. I think it's the professor's job. So here's where I differ. I think it's the professor's job to go out and seek those students that want the other things. And the ones that don't, they don't, they don't. Mm -hmm. I used to make all my students come to my office hours. I mean, every single student that I taught had to come and see me. Um, I had one professor that actually made every single student fill out surveys and then come and see them. Um, and then he would take a photograph as, as they walked in the door. Uh, <laughs> this is where documenting everything. Yeah. Um, that's a little overboard. 
So I've stopped making all the students come and see me because I've actually changed my view on this a little bit um, since I don't get freshmen. Now, if you got freshmen, I'd see the job differently. But since I mostly get upperclassmen, I figure they by this time they kind of know what they want. They're going to talk to me at all, and I don't want to waste my time uh, on the students that aren't interested because that takes away from the time of the students that are interested. Because you know, time is finite. I've got a kid now, uh, which makes time much more of an issue for me. And I want to devote my time to the students that really want to see me. Uh, in my current position, I've got three meetings set up next week with students, and I haven't even really started a job yet. Right. So um, you know, there's different ways of looking at things. Office hours here are less formal. I mean, there was at, at Penn State, there's a specific number of required office hours. Here, it's you know, do as many as you feel is appropriate. Uh, so it's all over the map. I've just been walking down the halls from where my new office is. Some, they still have their spring term stuff up. Some are doing like two hours a week. Some are doing like 10, you know, informal office hours. Uh, so it's, it's all over the map. Um, they got, they were genuinely shocked when I said I want to do office hours at both my offices. Like, really? Like, well, yeah, because certain students will come to the one building. The other one's on the other side of campus. Right certain ones want to come there because um, I don't want I don't want the students that are on the fence about showing up or not to be dissuaded by walking an extra 20 minutes. You know, if they want to see me, I want them to come see me. You know, I don't want that to be the thing that holds you up. And for students, sometimes it can be, especially if it's, you know, 105 degrees out. You know, it could be the or, difference between if you're alive, dead in a ditch. <laughs> or they have accessibility issues. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's even more extreme. Yeah, I'm just talking about just lazy. Right. Yeah. Let alone an actual need. Right. So, so I think you hit on a couple of things, but I want to I want to couch this first in in the broader conversation. We have the the idealized what was it like? That's what the article sort of says. You know, I grew up and this is how my experience was, and this wasn't this was my experience last week. It was some time ago, right? Twenty, thirty something years ago. Well, thirty something years ago, the percentage of people who were going to college was lower. Right? And you go even further back, the percentage is lower. And so we're at the point now where it's assumed that if you want a middle class job, and of course, let's have a conversation if you want about what actually, can you get a middle class job just by graduating from college? But we'll ignore that point. Um, but it's assumed that you have to get that. That's a minimum criteria now. Yeah. Right? So we have lots and lots of people go. We have lots of different outlets for college. You can go for the uh, for profit universities and uh, online, or you can do all these other kinds of things. But there's an assumption that everybody goes to college some way or another. And that's increased the numbers. I mean, it's one of those things where the university isn't staying the same size. The universities are getting bigger. Number of faculty, number of students are all going up. Um, and they're changing how they structure some of these things. You know, there have always been these spaces where you could buy your way out of teaching, perhaps, if you have enough grant money. Um, depending on the college now, that changes how many uh, classes you may have to do. And so there's these balancing things. Uh, so, you know, our college is... There's a normal teaching load for a research productive faculty. There is a teaching load for a less productive faculty. There are teaching load for clinical professors. There are teaching loads for um, fixed term one, which is somebody who is basically exclusively a teacher on a one-year contract, right? And there's the range inside of that. With all of that, you end up stacking some of these classes where, uh, you know, when I went to college, I think I had one class above 60 and the vast majority of my classes at a public university were in the 20 to 30 range. Now you're seeing undergrad classes, particularly freshman and sophomore year, where you've got 100, 200, 300, right? So if we start following that trend, what you have is 300 students, let's say, and how connected can you be with the faculty, with the professor? If you have one class with 300, let alone the teacher is teaching, professor is teaching three sections that semester of 200, 300 each. Now, some people make it happen. I know there's a, a colleague of mine who, I've never seen, I think, less than three students in their office at any given time, and that's often without her even in the office. There'll be students in the office, and there's times when it's four or five in the office plus 10 or 15 in the hallway. Um, you know, and so see, and that's with it. She's teaching the large classes and so forth. But I, I think you've got these just growth of these massive classes, and so that's, you know, go to the psychology things. You, you sort of de-individualize um, 
in some respects, from the professor's perspective, you even dehumanize the, the students. There aren't students. It's just those people out there in the audience because I don't have contact. I don't have a relationship with them. And so it's easier to step back. Now, of that population, there are still going to be probably the 5 or 10% to, to follow Robert's theme that are, no matter what, going to show up at your office. They really believe in it. They want to meet with you and so forth. But I think that when it gets that big, you start to get into that spot that 50% or 60% just feel like there is no connection. They never felt a connection. They don't see anything like that. And they're not going to go out of their way necessarily to even connect. And if that's their experience in their freshman and sophomore year, as Robert was talking about, by the time they hit junior or senior, they don't even think to meet the professor. They don't know who their professor is. The professor is just that person who stands in front of the room. Uh, hopefully they stand in front of the room. It's not just something they're broadcasting on, on the internet once a week. you know. And, and that, I think, has gotten to the point where, sure, y you miss out on something. Right? Yes. Yeah, but there are the instructors, even in the big classes, uh, wrong. Um, what did he have? Some 3,000 students a year? Mm -hmm. And the students were very connected with him because he went out of his way to connect with them. Um, but I think that meeting with this week, I mean, are my students. <laughs> right. Um, motorcycle going by. Motorcycle going by my house, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's added commentary. Right. That's right. The fighters right. say. <laughs> uh, so I, I think you can, if you want to, cultivate, uh, hey, if you've got issues on this, you know, come see me. I'm the guy who will talk to undergrads or I'm the guy who will talk to MBA students. Um, you need help with things, you know. You get certain professors where you find out if uh, people are having certain kinds of outside issues, uh, personal problems, mm -hmm. drinking problems, uh, the ones where you can go and connect and get some help if you want to, you know, a little less formal, don't want to be entered into the system, you know, by going and, and seeking out more professional help. Uh, so I think, I think it's still, it's there, but I think it's more incumbent on us to put it out there. But again, I, I'm a big believer in the master apprenticeship model of knowledge transfer, that the tacit stuff isn't going to transfer unless we seek to essentially have acolytes <laughs> that will follow what we say and follow us around and learn by doing. Right. Um, where a lot of people don't see, I see these, I see my students all as potential knowledge workers, uh, as opposed to, I just don't want to look at them that way. So mm -hmm. I think it's somewhat philosophical. I don't want to look at them as a number. You know, even though, even when I was at Penn State, 55,000 students, you know, business school had what, six, almost 6,000. Huge numbers of students, but I want to look at them. I don't want to dehumanize them because I don't like what that says about me. So I guess it's all totally selfish. I'm <laughs> doing it for me, for my own worldview. Uh, so if you're psychological egoist, it is self-interested behavior on my part. But uh, I just don't like that. I, 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 it could be a reaction to my undergraduate experience uh, where I, I felt like nobody gave a crap. They didn't know who I was. You know, um, where I left the sciences because you know, I took the first exam and I felt I got about 20% of it wrong. And so I figured I'm a moron. And so I bailed. And I ended up finding out that, no, that's like A territory. Yeah. But I didn't have anyone that, you know, to mentor me along or who gave a crap so they saw me drop they knew i found out i got the highest grade because it's back when you used to be able to post <laughs> uh, and you, you could see how you were compared to everybody else they didn't seek me out so hey dude why'd you drop and i said well because i'm a moron <laughs> you know, clearly you know i got a 70. And she's like no no like the standards are 50. Well, see, that was a real problem. See, I, I can understand it. You said you got 20% wrong, and then you got a 70. So you have some math issues. Let me just be clear about this here. <laughs> oh, I never said I could do math. I only have so many fingers and toes. I think one of the things, too, to build on I what I can't Robert, do the English either. To build on what Robert said, uh, I think that it's it's professor students are, are each to blame a little bit. But there's also, a, I don't know if you want to call it culture or society or whatever, where you know a lot of institutions are cutting back many most institutions are cutting back on their tenure track lines and they're filling all these slots with adjuncts right mm -hmm, so you mm -hmm. have all these adjuncts these adjuncts are teaching two three four different places you know a semester they have no time to commit to that institution to interact with these students they're trying to essentially not be homeless well right? let, let's and let's really put it down as clearly as possible what you have there is 
there's no commitment from the university to the to the adjuncts. It's it's a semester to semester in a lot of spot situations. Right. And then, so why are they going to commit backwards, saying I may be right. gone by the end of the semester? You know, I may have to go somewhere else. So from following that logic through, yeah, there's no commitment on either side. Yeah, and if you consider, if, if you take this trend that we're seeing is college, you go to college to get a job as opposed to going to college to get educated, right? So this, is, this is purely job training. Then that fits that model because you don't want to, you, you want to spit out as many degrees as possible, train as many people as possible. But you're not educating these people. You're not trying to develop this mm -hmm. sort of connection with them, this knowledge transfer, which you're basically trying to get them as certified so they can go out and, and do something in the workplace, yeah. which is something that he was sort of, you know, approaching. He didn't quite say it that way in the article, but that's sort of the culture of the university right now. And uh, what we're seeing, this lack of students, you know, professor interaction is a product of, of that culture. Mm -hmm. I think some of it is just a general cultural trend, too. Mm -hmm. Just people don't talk to anyone. Stare at their screen. Well, he quoted a, uh, he actually didn't mention that, you know, why go see the professor when you can shoot an email? He also quoted a study, which I think builds off of several things that we said, was that in 1967, 86% of the students asked, uh, polled in a questionnaire, um, responded that developing meaningful philosophy of life um, was very important to them, and that was more than double the number of students who said being very well off financially. Mm -hmm. And more recently, the questionnaire was given. I uh, can't find the date off off here quickly, but uh, basically, it said that the uh, meaningful philosophy of life had plumbled to plumbled to forty five percent of the students, uh, you know, wanting that, and eighty two percent saying, "Well, they want to get a job." You know, they yeah, but they're, not, they're not controlling for the economy. They're not. They're not controlling for the economy. They're not also controlling what Stephen pointed out was more students coming in. So, but it has become know, the new high school. Well, yes, but what, back when Stephen had mentioned you know, 20, 30 years ago, it was wealthier people who were going to college. So they weren't as worried about being well off financially because they were coming from sort of the stream of, you know, well, they're probably better off families. Now, when you have families from all diverse social economical backgrounds, you're going to have a lot more students saying, well, you know, this is my opportunity to sort of get bumped up a peg in the socioeconomic lab. Is that, do you have any actually, do we actually have any data on that? There's got to be data on that. I'm there's, sure that, there is. That there's that probably data. Or is that from That's my gut. Okay. That's my gut. I'm, I was just curious. So my gut says that too, but I don't know if that's right. So. Uh, my gut's usually right. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> I mean, the world has also changed, though, if you want to talk about it, in that the costs are going up pretty heavily for education since we're no longer subsidizing by the states, you know, right. the, or, and the federal government particularly. I mean, they, they talk about how public education used to be 50% or more from the federal government, and now it's zero. Um, so, public education actually being public dollars. Yeah. I mean, schools are, that's changed dramatically. No, we're hanging. We're hanging at about five percent of our of our entire operating budget is coming from the state, and zero yeah, from the federal. Dollars are going to public education. Now. Yeah. It's astounding. And of course, these trends vary. I mean, the smaller um, schools, the smaller schools may be seeing more sort of of that interaction, frequent interaction between students and professors. Mm -hmm. And there could be lots of different reasons for that, right? A lot of students um, self-select for that reason. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, a, a student who maybe is able to go to a small private liberal arts college may be financially better off. Maybe their parents have uh, gone to college and said, you know, this is how you do college. Right? Or, or but we have to be. To your professor, sir. You have to be clear about a liberal arts college. Some of them don't have set tuitions either. I mean, they basically take a look at your what does your financial say, and they say you can afford X dollars. So it's not necessarily well off, but it still has to have that same philosophy, which I think is where Robert was going with that, is that I believe in this kind of an education. So it's not, I'm not pursuing this for the job to get to what you were talking about earlier, Chris. I'm pursuing this because I want this educational experience. And so I've selected into that. And so you have a range perhaps on, on incomes or so forth, but you have to really want that anyway. You know, you want a class with 10 people. You know? Yeah, definitely seeing the range of incomes at, at, at the small liberal arts college, no doubt, no doubt in my mind whatsoever. But um, what I'm seeing, though, also is more of the I'm here to get a job. Hmm. And even at the liberal like, arts school? Even at the liberal arts school. You say, well, you know, you went to a liberal arts school. Because, you know, so they'll come in, they'll complain like, oh, my gosh, you know, why do I have to take fill in the blank? Whatever mm -hmm. course is not related to their major. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm like, well, this is part of a liberal arts education. You do a little bit of this, you do a little bit of that, and you focus on this one thing. And, um, and we, you know, I see a lot of students who, who sort of miss that point. Yeah. So no. I, I think it's it's a cultural change. I think it's I, I think it's a pretty complicated issue. Yeah. Uh, because there's a lot of different factors coming into play here. But I do think there has been a shift, at least on our side of the problem. Uh, set aside the whole increase in contingent workers in academia. The non-contingent workers basically seen students as a waste of their time. It seems to be, and again, this is just totally anecdotal on my part, it seems much worse just over the 10 years I've been in the game um, from definitely from when I was a student. Uh, and I wasn't one of those students that sought out the professor. I was also one that would never argue with one. <laughs> so and that's definitely, there's been a big increase in what the hell do you know? I'm a customer, screw you. And as an attitude among students, uh, definitely increased. I'm not seeing that as much, but again, it's probably a difference in the nature of the institution. Yeah, it's... it's and the major. a lot from when I was, and, yeah. when I was a student. Um, they just didn't do that. No. Uh, but that's also, look at high school. My high school, which was in your city, not the best high school, you know, the really lousy kid might bring a knife Oh no. <laughs> uh, where now you get, you know, fancy private, nice schools in the supposedly elite districts where kids are coming to the So some of it could just be a general cultural trend. But I, I think we definitely, as, as academics, or people that are potential academics, and I definitely see it as our duty to doctoral students to train them, um, you know, don't be an ass. Well, be approachable, care about people. Let's be clear about this. That's something we can do, but it all comes down to if you are a tenure track professor, you do what the other tenure track or the other tenured professors do. What are the full professors doing? And to me, that's the bigger issue. If, you know, Robert, you made a statement earlier of somebody, you know, was saying that it was like below them to talk to an undergrad, to teach undergrads or to interact with the undergrads. It does not, I don't deem myself worthy or, or them worthy to deal with me. I think that's the language you used. But if that's what's being said by the people at the, the top of the organization, right? That's what the students are going to learn. That's what the, the students are going to learn. That's well, what the junior faculty are going to do. Yeah. I mean, they, they can push back against it. But if you're concerned, if you're concerned about tenure, I mean, that's what you're going to do. Yeah, you should emulate. Yeah, because tenure is a busy political thing. Right. But the problem with that is once you get tenure, are you willing to change who you are or are, or are you going to fight along the way anyway? I mean, there's, there's such of those problems with that. And so this is a, if you want to call it sort of a slow acting cultural movement that's been happening throughout academia, you know, 30 years, 40 years. Again, the people that I can think of that I connected with when I was an undergrad were the most senior faculty. You know, they're the people who were, you know, there was the, the history professor who invited us all out to his farm. You know, we all went out to his farm and had dinner at his farm and, you know, I think we ate something that they killed that day and so forth. But, you know, that was that, was that side. You know, the, the professors within my major were the people who were, you know, 25, 30 years into the career. It wasn't anybody junior at all. They didn't have the time for it. They were focused on their research. They were focused on getting tenure and they weren't focused on connecting with the students. You know, when I was at my first job, I was told that the department chair should never hear from a student of yours. If you've done something wrong, that means you're not spending enough time on your class and they've come in and they've complained to me about that. If they're coming in to praise you, then you're spending too much time on your class. So you need to just be good enough and go about life. And that's what I was told. And if that's what I'm being told from my department chair, and that's what I'm being told from my senior faculty members as my first job out of, out of grad school, you know, how does that affect me? You know, what am I going to do? Did I see a lot of students in my office? No, no, I didn't. I saw students outside of my office and I tried to make time in class and time after class and so forth. But, you know, I wasn't going to necessarily have office hours that were that accessible because people told me not to worry about that. Not, or not even to worry about that. Don't do it. Actually, if you really think of what's implied in, in the statement. So. Yeah, I, but I think there's a, a little bit of an onus, at least on us. Um, as you get more senior, do something about it. 
Uh, you can nudge a little, lightly. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you, I'm nudging way the hell more here than I did at Penn State. Um, but I have very different status here. So I've already told a couple senior faculty, I don't want to do stuff. <laughs> and and they, they're listening to me. Um, and offered resources and tips and tricks and techniques, but always presented. I learned this from, who the hell was it? Who was Cameron Ford? Uh, gave me this bit of advice and it's worth and it's so obvious but it, it didn't click for me right away never ask a tenure track professor to do anything for which they are not rewarded and so everything I do is always couched in how this will help you how this will get you research how this will get you published better how this will get you know you additional metrics on which you can be measured uh, these kinds of things uh, that's the way I now I've generalized it I now go in when I tell the administrator stuff on how it will help them with their metrics. Uh, I'm, when I'm over in the research part and trying to push educational missions, saying, hey, then this is another thing you can point to. If your project happens to lose money, you can say, yes, it has this fantastic educational outcome, which can't be quantified with dollars. And they're like, oh, yeah. And you can get all this <laughs> buy it. Um, and he said it, it was just a throwaway comment, which seems to me blindingly obvious after the fact. But it just kind of really sunk in. And I, I think we can. You know, there's some nice, we can teach people to train their doctoral students to not be their little tiny slaves that go and get them lunch. Um, wow. Because that'll come back and bite them in the butt and their reputation, and it gets around. Uh, I mean, Chris's field, physics, much smaller field than the social sciences. Uh, I mean, our colleges are huge, and I, I, I know all the dirt about almost everyone in my field because everybody talks yep. everybody loves to gossip and academics I think more so than you know, any other group you want to pick we love to dish on each other uh, well it's composed by, by listening <laughs> oh my god the stuff I heard at conferences by just sitting there yeah. and not interrupting someone mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just you know you don't know but you just don't feel all this stuff like, like totally burn you man uh, I think there's some some opportunities there. Well, I, yeah, I think I think so. I think too. Part of it though is you know the culture that is. If you you shouldn't have to change when you're a senior faculty member, right? The difficulties. That's just the joys of the internet. So we were uh, rudely interrupting Chris. Yeah, so I was talking about how sort of the tenure standards could also be a block um, or interference for professors to invest time in students. And Robert was going to rudely interrupt me and say, Robert? I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right well, hey, brilliant you, point. Well, all right. Well, <laughs> we, it dropped. Let's just let it go. And uh, I'll bring up one other point um, that Robert and I were talking while we were trying to get our, our technical stuff together. Uh, the article also made an interesting comment uh, with 19, in 1960, 15% of grades were in the A range. And now uh, the claim is 43% of grades are in the A range, giving A the most common grade by far. So uh, one of the things that Robert brought up during the break was, well, if you give out more A's, that, that encourages fewer students to come interact with you. Because they're doing okay. Why should they come, right? <laughs> Yeah. Well, again, if what are we, what are tenure track professors, or actually, frankly, let's put it, what are what are all professors rewarded for? They're rewarded for students having a good experience, right? And Maybe. so, well, up to a point, right? We know there's somewhere as long as they aren't actively protesting and doing school stuff. Here. So, how many A's have you gotten this year, or how much money have you brought in? Right. Those are all reasons. I remember my rude point. My rude point was is that I didn't know, and I was talking to Chris, and he didn't really get it either, that uh, when we were done as doctoral students, uh, I figured all schools were pretty much the same. Uh, and now I know they aren't. Uh, you can go to schools at the exact same level uh, of whatever level you're looking for, same kind of level, liberal arts school or research one school or whatever, which have radically different cultures. Um, so you want to be more student interactive or student focused there are mm -hmm. places that actually genuinely care oh yeah. and then I'm if you so don't there are places that were quite literally do not care mm -hmm. i misunderstood you i was talking about coming out of high school i didn't know what i was doing oh no coming i was out coming out of graduate school i knew that 
Oh, okay. No, as a doc student, I was aware of that by that point. Yeah, I had a clue. I figured, okay, everybody's an ass, so. No. I had a really strong alumni network in grad school that I had a really good sense of what were the different types of schools. Uh, that being said, I mean, we had people who disavowed knowledge, you know, people within my program who disavowed knowledge of students who didn't go to the correct schools, you know, but um, it was always sort of a running joke if you look at the list of graduates from my department, because um, they actually have a list on the website. There are um, only basically Research One schools listed on there, which is not all of our students. Right, right. It's like, sorry, you didn't make it. In fact... We have we have actually students who make who are at Research One schools, but still not prestigious enough Research One schools that are not listed on there. Or students are listed on there, but they're listed at their previous institution where they didn't get tenure, as opposed to their current institution. Um, whereas other ones were updated when they climbed the ladder. You know those kinds of things. So I had went to a small private liberal arts college out of high school because, well, quite frankly, they gave me the most money. I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. I didn't know much about college at all, actually. And uh, what I luckily landed into was, a, was an environment that was very nurturing, very much um, a lot of interactions between professors and students. I went to my professor, my physics professor's house every year. We had a Christmas party, a spring party, so, sort of things that I do because that's what I learned from him. Uh, and so when I went to graduate school, I knew that what I wanted to do was land a job at a teaching focused institution where what I did would be rewarded by or what my rewards would come from quality teaching. Mm -hmm. So I knew that going in. Uh, did I run into some of what Steve uh, Stephen said? Absolutely. Uh, I had I had heard other people from other people that other folks. I'm trying to be as convoluted as possible here. Um, that thought, you know, I was wasting my talents by pursuing a teaching focused job. Mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We got the whole thing. Don't you dare even mention that you might want to go into consulting. Yeah. Well, no one said it to me explicitly. I had basically heard from others that others had said. It's sort of that kind of, you know, um, that kind of thing. But, you know, I I guess I don't know what point I'm trying to make here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> this is a fantastic story. There's a lot of pressure by advisors put on their students of where they're allowed to go. Mm -hmm. There can like, be, yes. There like, can be. What do you mean allowed to go? Yep. One, these people are adults. Two, it's just like, you know, we fought a war over slavery. You're like, come on, we're not, we shouldn't be acting like this. These are not our serfs, our servants. Uh, but we wouldn't want to be embarrassed by one of my students being not being placed at a top 50 institution. Yeah, well, I can say I, I had, you know, the exact opposite experience of that. I had a fantastic advisor who was encouraging me to do what it is that I wanted to do. And not everybody gets that uh, experience. Very rare, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I didn't understand how rare it was until, you know, I was getting along in grad school and then got out of grad school and started talking to other people at my first job and what their grad experience is like. And I was like, oh, wow, it's, uh, you know, got a different. A, a different experience, yeah, which yeah. is good. Um, good for me. I don't think I would have made it to grad school with the type of uh, advisor that was just described by Robert. Hmm. Um, maybe not, I don't know. So uh, anyway, um, kind of get the the vibe here that the conversation is winding down so i think we will go ahead and wrap up this uh episode please follow us on twitter uh at a prof life or you can uh email us uh which i can't i told you guys last time i'd remember the email address and i totally lied so you can just email me chris at jestercat.com with any comments and i will make sure to pass them on to the appropriate people <laughs> please subscribe to YouTube, leave comments, make suggestions as to what we Five should talk about this time. Five yeah. star reviews. Just review us. And uh, no, hopefully, five star reviews. <laughs> hopefully we will have iTunes up and going uh, very soon. So until then, everybody, let's get back to writing.